The following program is the work of the broadcast students at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. BCIT Magazine features news stories from around the Lower Mainland which were produced over the last week. Responsibility for the content of the show rests completely with the students and their instructors. Today on BCIT Magazine. A local MLA is taking the Welfare Food Challenge. Two daycares make funding requests to City Council. And ICBC is highlighting pedestrian safety at a campaign in Vancouver. Hello and welcome to BCIT Magazine. I'm Radhika Sikikane. And I'm Brady Tretanero. What if you only had $18 to last the whole week? What would you spend it on? How far does that much go at the grocery store? A local politician is finding out as she participates in the Welfare Food Challenge. Frances Lee has the story. Today is my birthday, as I had mentioned, so I believe I'm going to be celebrating uh, with craft dinner. It's not something Vancouver Mount Pleasant MLA, Melanie Mark, would typically choose as her celebration dinner. But because of the welfare food challenge, her birthday dinner is quite restrictive. It's now 1.40 and I've eaten a bowl of cereal with 2% milk, uh, so I'll be, I'll be ration, rationing this throughout the week. Mark is participating in the Welfare Food Challenge, which means for the next week, she has less than $3 a day to spend on groceries. The challenge was started five years ago by Raise the Rates Vancouver, a coalition of community groups that are advocating for an increase in welfare. We know that the pressure is building. You know, 78% of British Columbians want a poverty reduction plan, which includes raising welfare. According to Raise the Rates Vancouver, 82% of welfare checks goes to rent, while 6% goes to personal hygiene products and a cell phone. No vegetables, no fruit, um, it's all starches, all carbs, and we know how, um, you know, it's just not a healthy diet that people are forced to live on. And while the challenge only lasts a week for Melanie Mark, it remains an everyday reality to those who rely on welfare to get by for Mark and Raise the Rates Vancouver. They hope this is the final year of the Welfare Food Challenge. Francis Lee in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Two new Westminster neighborhoods are in serious need of childcare spaces, but only one is receiving funding from the city. Kyle Benning visited Glenbrook Daycare to learn more. Dibia Mole has been bringing her kids to Glenbrook Daycare for years after other daycares didn't work out. But the program she has put her son in is unable to expand because the non-profit daycare has had their funding request denied by the city. Instead, council voted to give funding to an after-school program in Queensboro. But Molly says even though she lives in Queensboro, daycare in that part of the city would be harder to reach because of traffic congestion. Well, I work in New West, so it's actually more convenient for me to drop off the kids. Um, and also it's close by, so the Queensboro Bridge is a nightmare. Um, and due to when the time that I finish work, um, you know, it wouldn't be possible for me to be able to sometimes get across the bridge um, and pick them up on time. A city report found that Queensboro is the neighborhood in the most need of childcare services, and council has around $50,000 available to fill that void. But we've recognized significant challenges in the Queensboro neighborhood. Uh, this is one of our fastest growing parts of the city and in particular for, for young families. Yet uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, child care uh, uh, facilities have not been growing at the same pace. Despite the report, Glenbrook's manager thinks they too have a need that has to be met. You know, for a $30,000 investment, I can open up uh, a facility for January 1st for 12 infant toddlers and 17 after school children. And it, it's a huge need, really huge need. Most of my families, well, I wouldn't say most, but gee, 60% of my families have two children in this daycare already. For parents in Queensboro, the funding means a new daycare, but also a new wait list to get their children in. 
Kyle Benning in New Westminster for BCIT Magazine. Living in Vancouver isn't always affordable, and those added expenses can be hard for the elderly. Eric Dashwitz has this story. Linda Brendan is a visually impaired senior who lives in a temporary shelter. She was once homeless and living on the streets when she was unable to find a place to stay. I became homeless uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, I was working and the company sold their business and I lived upstairs and of course I had to go. She went without a home for two weeks before an emergency shelter accepted her and she is not alone. Over 3,500 seniors like Linda are still waiting for permanent affordable housing. A recent report on affordability in Metro Vancouver showed a 38% increase for seniors waiting for affordable housing between 2012 and 2016. All this while the government claimed to be taking action. You can imagine the kind of bottleneck that this creates when we don't have enough permanent housing for, for seniors with low income. If you're a low-income senior, you can get a BC Senior Supplement, $49.30 a month. That's what you got in the 90s, it's what you got in 2000s, and it's what you're getting today. It hasn't changed. I'm very hopeful that I'm, I, I'm getting closer to finding a place that I can call my own. For Linda, and many others like her, there is no solution on the horizon until more sustainable housing can be built. Eric Dakwitz, in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. Our reporter Eric Dashwoods now joins us live. So Eric, what are these seniors doing when they're not able to find permanent housing? Well Brady, they're turning to family members or relatives. But if this option is not available, then they're turning to permanent or to um, temporary or emergency shelters, often for longer periods than anticipated. Linda's been in the same place for the last year and a half, even though her initial stay was only supposed to be six months. And what was the political response? Well, BC's NDP government is taking this very seriously and is saying that the current provincial government is being too lax on providing affordable housing for seniors. They say that they will not see the amount of seniors curb in um, housing availability until more of this can be provided. Back to you. Thank you, Eric. ICBC has launched a pedestrian safety campaign as accidents increase at this time of year. Quinn Allen has the story. Pedestrian safety is a major concern in the Lower Mainland. On average, 59 people are killed every year in pedestrian crashes in BC. Chief Constable Neil Dubord offers some helpful safety advice to civilians. Keep your heads up and ensure you're aware of your surroundings. Don't be distracted or texting while you're walking. Wear reflective clothing, especially this time of year when it's dark and dreary. About 70% of pedestrian crashes in Vancouver happen at intersections, like this one behind me. We're just minutes before the press conference started, a man was crossing the street on his bike, only to a car turning right and hitting him and breaking his bike mirror. Unfortunately, the car got away on a hit and run. Incidents like this happen on a weekly basis in Vancouver. ICBC Director of Road Safety, Lindsay Matthews, explains the features of this fall's safety campaign. In fact, almost half of pedestrian fatalities occur between October and January. Today we're launching an awareness campaign including radio ads to reach drivers while they're behind the wheel and transit ads to reach pedestrians at bus shelters, on buses and sky trains throughout the Lower Mainland. VPD officers and volunteers spent the morning handing out safety reflectors to the public, which people attach to their clothing so drivers can see them in low light conditions. Quinn Allen in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Coming up next on BCIT Magazine, a local business turns waste into new resources. And we check up on BCIT's newest sleeping facilities. A defining moment for me was when I finished my first internship and got lots of really great feedback from industry professionals. I would never imagine I'd be walking into the floors of TSN and thinking, I'm not a student anymore, I'm here to work. I will be starting a job with an investigative news program in Toronto and I'm really excited to see that grow into what will become hopefully my dream job. BCIT broadcast and online journalism, putting you to work. 
Standby graphics, ready camera one. If you want to experience the fast-paced world of news, today on BCIT Magazine, striking. Make magic on a movie set, frame, and action. Or bring your creative ideas to life. BCIT's hands-on training will get you started. BCIT Television and Video Production. Your possibilities start here. Welcome back. Shakeout BC earthquake drills took place across the province, preparing for the big one. Today we are joined in studio by Sharon Lewis, the Manager of Emergency Management at BCIT. Sharon, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. How did the drill turn out for students on campus? Actually, it was very good. We had a really good turnout today. We, uh, we had a practice drill over in the Great Hall where we actually set it up like a classroom environment. And um, when we piped through the noise of the earthquake, um, everybody did the procedure, drop cover and hold on. Um, so that in the event of a real disaster, people will know a second nature what to do. So we like to practice these drills. And how can people be prepared for when the actual big one strikes? Well, it's very important to have your own emergency preparedness plan in place, have your kits ready, have um, a grab and go with all emergency supplies. Um, if you're on campuses, um, definitely know where your assembly points are so that in the event that you're able to get out safely, you would congregate in that area and follow the advice of emergency response personnel so that you know where to um, go to sh safely shelter. Okay, um, what is the earthquake procedure for BCIT? Well, we have an all hazards plan and we've got um, trained staff that are all volunteers here at BCIT. So um, again, if you get evacuated from a building, go to the assembly points and follow the um, instructions by emergency personnel. It's hard to know what exactly is going to happen, but that's why it's important that you follow those instructions. Thank you. And where can people find more information on earthquake preparedness? Um, if you go to our website, Safety, Security and Emergency Management, um, we have our emergency response guides on there for all, all campuses, including all the satellites. And uh, it's got everything in there about all kinds of hazards and um, different responses that you can expect. Thank you, Sharon. You're welcome. It's Waste Reduction Week, a public awareness campaign that asks Canadians to think about what they throw away and where it goes. Our reporter Amy Quinton visits two local entrepreneurs who are turning garbage into opportunity. For a facility that takes this and turns it into this, it is surprisingly tidy. This is Hop, a venture that started in Calgary and has recently opened a new facility in Vancouver. Hop turns food waste into nutrient-rich organic compost. Because the composting is contained indoors, it eliminates the problematic odors from outdoor compost sites. The process is unique. All the composting happens in the vessel. Uh, the computer's uh, keeping track of, of the oxygen levels as well as the, the temperatures and the pH um, of, of the compost environment inside uh, and it's making micro adjustments every 60 seconds. So what the result is, is we end up with compost that has more nutrients uh, available for plants um, and as opposed to it happening in that six months to, to a year period, uh, we create compost in 10 to 12 days. Hop collects food waste from local restaurants and hotels and then sells the finished product to farmers and gardeners. Brienne Miller is tackling waste reduction in another way through her zero waste market, where groceries can be purchased without any packaging. Miller believes that in addition to the three R's of reduce, reuse and recycle, there are two more. So there are five R's. Oh, the first is refuse. So, and I think that is actually the most important one. Um, so starting to tackle the waste at the source um, before it even gets to the point where you need to recycle or you know, reduce your consumption is actually refusing it in the first place. Um, and then the fifth R is actually rot. So if you reduce, refuse, reuse, recycle, and then rot or compost is the last one. So. Miller thinks innovative ventures like these encourage Canadians to consider where their garbage ends up when they throw it away. Time. Amy Quinton in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. 
We now go live to our reporter, Amy Quinton. Amy, can you tell us more about Waste Reduction Week? Absolutely, Radhika. You know, it seems like in today's world of social media, we're really inundated with different awareness campaigns, but Waste Reduction Week is, some, is one that we should really pay attention to. Its messaging is pretty simple. It, we just want Canadians to sort of look at their garbage in a different way and realize that there really isn't such a thing as throwing something away. You know, the paper plastic that you put in the garbage ends up somewhere. So we have to be aware of the consequences of that. And how are the companies you featured involved? Well, the zero waste market is actually putting on a zero waste hike where they're teaching participants to make package free snacks to really, you know, limit their impact when they're out on the trail. You can also find more information about that on their Facebook page. Back to you. Thanks, Amy. The Hope and Shadows calendar has become a yearly tradition in Vancouver. The calendar features photos taken by local homeless and low income residents that show the positive side of the downtown east side. The calendar is sold throughout the, set, the city by a dedicated team of vendors who earn a small stipend from each sale. As Nicole Oud found out, this year's calendar has a special meeting for those vendors. It's an exciting morning for 13 talented photographers. This is the team behind the annual Hope and Shadows calendar. Today they are showing off the photos that made it into this year's edition. But this is the first time I'm in the calendar, so I'm very excited. This year the photos in the calendar were taken by the people who will be selling them on the streets. All the photos in this year's calendar were taken by the vendors, the folks who sell the calendar and the monthly Megaphone magazine. Um, and it's really a chance for them to own their own story and, and control how they're being talked about in the media and really show a different side of what it's like to experience poverty and homelessness. Stefan Scott has been selling the Hope and Shadows calendar since 2011. He says having his picture included this year makes it extra special. It mean a lot to me because it gave me an opportunity to to uh, tell my customer I'm in the calendars, I made it. After all those years, in the corner, I, me I finally make inside the calendar, which is awesome. Scott and the other photographers picked up the new calendars and hit the street this week. The Hope and Shadows calendar is available throughout Vancouver and Victoria while supplies last. Nicole out in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. All right, one. Last year, BCIT made headlines by introducing two different student sleep initiatives. Our reporter Jaylene Matthews went to find out if the sleeping pods have been successful. First, they gave us the nap room. Next, they introduced the pods. BCIT's sleeper pod program and nap room initiative were driven to existence by visible demand. Faculty was noticing students sleeping on benches and couches all over campus. But are these hideaways for sleepy students really getting used? It's popular, yeah. In the one month that we had them, um, the booking system ready, there's been 126 bookings. Every time I look over there, it's, it's um, you know, used. Dirty pods have yet to be an issue. The students are responsible for cleaning the pods themselves. We have uh, actually uh, organic cleaning wipes in there, so they can wipe it down before and after and neither has getting dirty in the pods. Um, the sleep pods are being watched by a camera. In the future, BCIT hopes to bring the bedroom to the classroom. And those pods, instead of being purchased overseas, uh, they'll be manufactured, hopefully, as a student initiative at BCIT. Faculty considers the pilot programs to be a success, so for now, the dream continues for BCIT's sleepiest students. Jaylene Matthews in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. Coming up next on BCIT Magazine, UBC unveils a new competitive video gaming facility. A Burnaby man hand makes and rents out Halloween costumes. The most rewarding thing for me has been the relationships I developed in the program, both with instructors and classmates. My sense of confidence has never, never been higher. I mean, this, this program has offered great opportunities to be in real world, real industry situations, and, and being in those moments and knowing I can contribute, I can do this. It's exciting to be in this industry and to meet lots of great people and to make amazing friends. BCIT broadcast and online journalism, realizing your potential.
I chose BCIT because I know that all the programs are very hands-on. We have our own radio station, like it's, it's one of the best programs that I've ever heard of. I am starting a job on Monday, so confidence is high. Well, honestly, I didn't think it was going to be this fun. The Vancouver Polish Film Festival is happening from October 21st to the 23rd. SFU is holding screenings of 11 films celebrating the best current Polish productions at the Gold Corp Centre for the Arts. Tickets are available at vpff.ca for $10 and $12 at the door. The West Coast Women's Show at the Tradex Trade and Exhibition Centre in Abbotsford is holding its 16th annual Women's Celebration from October 21st to 23rd. Fraser Valley women will get a head start on their holiday shopping with entertainment from celebrity speakers, fashion shows and cooking demonstrations and so much more. The Van Dusen Botanical Garden is hosting Glow in the Garden from October 24th until Halloween night. Guests will walk through the woods and see lights, hear ghoulish music and observe glowing pumpkin characters created by carvers. Tickets are $10 for adults and $6 for children. That was this week's Community Calendar. Welcome back. Van Funding 2016 took place in Vancouver this week, where more than 50 speakers and experts educated attendees on crowdfunding. While crowdfunding continues to grow in Canada, my co-anchor Brady Chantanero reports there are some pitfalls. Crowdfunding was the focus at this year's second annual Van Funding Conference in Vancouver. Crowdfunding is growing rapidly and it's expected to reach 90 billion worldwide in annual volume by 2020, but there's lots to be learned when it comes to the practice. Shane Gibson is an international speaker and sales expert who notes the problems with some crowdfunding campaigns. And so I think the really important thing is build the community, build the crowd before you do the thing. And I think everybody's so focused on the thing, the technology, their latest widget, and they're just into their thing that they, they're their own best kept secret until the day they realize they need funding or they want to fund it. And they haven't been telling their story and connecting with people for the last year or two. GoFundMe and Kickstarter are two of the more popular crowdfunding platforms. But one entrepreneur who raised around $300,000 through Kickstarter warns about the dangers of launching a campaign without being prepared. There's a lot of companies that go on Kickstarter and, and fund their company through that, and that's not really the strategy. I think the strategy should be that your, your company has to be viable outside of Kickstarter, and then you go on Kickstarter really to promote a new product or really fuel a launch. But you kind of have to have all your ducks in order. Otherwise, you're going to have other disappointments, just like you know, you're going to maybe raise hundreds of thousands of dollars, but not really have the executional capabilities to, um, to really fulfill your product, and that could be a big issue. Craig Asano, the director of the NCFA who put on this year's event, says crowdfunding in Canada continues to grow. You know, we're pretty confident saying that the market is, is growing, you know, 20, 30, 50 percent year over year. It's, it's roughly $200 million across all the various forms of, of crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is growing rapidly in Canada, but it's conferences like these that are reminding prospective entrepreneurs that it isn't as simple as launching a web page. Bray Tretnero in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Competitive video gaming is on the rise in Canada and is now considered a sport. UBC's Electronic Sports Association has unveiled a new high-tech facility for its members and UBC students. Siobhan Litter took a look at the state of the art venue. These new gaming computers at UBC's eSports facility are worth over $100,000. It's an investment UBC hopes will help students with tuition costs. Members of the eSports Association play in competitive video gaming tournaments and winners of these tournaments are given a prize in the form of scholarship money. This new gaming facility is equipped with 22 state-of-the-art computers. What we're looking to use this lounge for is not only to give back to the community uh, in order to you know, let them de-stress a bit, play a few games here and there between classes, but also offer some of our premier teams the opportunity to practice against other teams and give them a simulated tournament experience where they're all in one room competing together as a team. Teams and students are able to practice at the facility between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. every day. Esports director Josh Lowen narrowly lost a StarCraft tournament last year. It's providing a space for a bunch of people to play games together. And for most people, you end up playing games um, 
in your room or dorm or wherever, but you never get a space where you can have 20 people uh, to come together and play games and just really be there for the sake of uh, not only playing games together, but you know, being able to enjoy a space together. The eSports facility had a lineup around the hallway in UBC student building and students were eager to try out the new technology. With the new equipment, the eSports Association hopes to have more students join and enter tournaments to better their tuition expenses. Siobhan Litter in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Halloween is just over a week away. Justice Doucette has more a costume shop that's been open in Burnaby for more than 80 years and the man that creates the outfits. I got lane one. Lots of costume rentals. Hi, Watts Costumes. Diva McDonald, the store manager of Watts Costumes in Burnaby, answers the phone during the busiest time of the year, Halloween. Customers are calling to rent some of the over 10,000 unique costumes, most of which were handcrafted by this man. Well, to begin with, I have to make a new pair of pants for the scarecrow because those have been sort of worn out. And I figured this is the bright enough we can put patches on it. Ray Buchanan is 86 years old and has worked at Watts Costumes for over 50 years. The demand for new outfits is always keeping him busy. I would say maybe a couple hundred a year, but it depends on what type we're working on because some are very quick to buzz up. Watts does not sell the costumes, only rents them out. McDonald believes that there is one reason why renting is a better option than buying your costume. Our costumes are really good quality and one of a kind. You're not going to be, there's not going to be eight other people in the same costume as you. For Buchanan, the inspiration for costume ideas comes from many different places. Basically TV and for quick turnarounds, the movies. What If a really, really good blockbuster comes out, then that's what people are into. During his time at Watts, Buchanan has created thousands of unique outfits, including this French court costume. Justice Doucette in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. I'm Brady Tretnero. And I'm Radhika Sigi-Kane. Thank you for tuning in to BCIT Magazine.